Hi, folks. How are you? I'm Ryan. That's me. I, uh, I was just telling my friends over there, my new friends, that this morning I was thinking that the, uh, one of the most uh, terrible things that could happen with public speaking is that no one shows up. And I kind of, I pictured this morning like four people being out there, one of them being my employee who's being paid right now to be here. Uh, and then of course I could just make a fool of myself, that's the next worst thing, which uh, that could still happen. But at least I have people here, so thank you for coming. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself that will build a little bit of context for um, what I'm going to share. I'll warn you about um, one thing real quick, and not in an annoying, self-deprecating way, but just in an honest way. This isn't one of those presentations where uh, you're going to find out what's next. I'm not that guy. Uh, I don't know what's next, necessarily. This is about some fundamental and foundational truths that I think um, are important in communicating a message to uh, consumers, or how we think of them anymore, users. Uh, and it's just my opinion. Uh, so, you know, I, I could guarantee, and I almost hope that at the end, someone comes up and has a question or an argument and says, you know what, you're full of shit. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, and it would be mostly true. So, uh, a little bit about um, where I come from, and uh, I suppose uh, why I'm up here. Uh, I started a, really at the time, it was a web design company back in 2001. Uh, it's called Buck Wild, I'm the CEO and the founder of it. It's a small group. We have an office here in Seattle. We have an office in California. Um, and uh, again, at the time, it was a web design company. Uh, I had no real lofty goals. Uh, I was 22 or 21 or something. And so, you know, the, the very idea of being in business for myself at all was the lofty goal. And uh, that felt fine to me. But with literally um, no connections, we didn't know anybody, uh, we didn't um, really have a clue uh, about anything, uh, I wanted to look for business in, in two areas, uh, uh, something that would be fun and something that we're, where we would find residual business. Uh, and you know, at the ripe age of 22, I thought, well, the music industry would be badass to work in. Uh, I didn't know how little they paid uh, yet. Uh, I, Later I found out. Um, and advertising. I thought if we got to work with advertising agencies, um, doing websites for advertising agencies, and so on, uh, there'd be more work there and we'd be able to stay in business and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and we started, we did that. So we got into music pretty quickly. That was the first industry that really kind of led us in the doors. Advertising agencies weren't particularly interested. Uh, and we uh, did websites originally uh, and then later it would turn into marketing for music artists through record labels. And uh, in about 2007, uh, we saw an opportunity to go directly to the music artists and uh, operate as an agency uh, to artists to uh, market and sell directly to the fan themselves. Uh, that company, we spun it off out of Buckwild, and we called it Ground Control, and we started with one client. Everything that I've, I've done, I have a couple companies, and everything I've, I've done has been bootstrapped and struggled and been a pain in the ass. And So we started with one client, and it was Backstreet Boys, and uh, they're still our client today, believe it or not. They're huge overseas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, and now... Uh, Luckily and thankfully, we have about 300 clients, um, uh, still independent, uh, Taylor Swift, and Lincoln Park, The Eagles, Bob Dylan, My Morning Jacket, a whole bunch of clients, and it's, it's really a lot of fun. Um, I don't run that company anymore. I have partners and, and friends who run that. Um, I'm just a partner. Going back to Buck Wild, later, uh, probably around 07, 08, agencies finally let us in, maybe, maybe a little bit earlier than that. And we did our first project with some friends of ours uh, at an agency in California for Disney. And um, in the ensuing years, we worked on uh, loads and loads of interactive campaigns uh, uh, with agencies all over the country, from the very, very big ones to smaller ones. And slowly but surely, we started to get some direct clients of ourselves, where we were starting to have to correct, uh, or rather, craft the message. Um, and oftentimes, what we would do when we would sit down to concept, um, when somebody would have an idea, 
particularly when they were coming from, uh, and traditional agency folks, if you're out there, I'm, 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 uh, <laughs> none of this is pejorative. I'm thankful to tra traditional agencies, and we've learned a lot from them. But oftentimes when we were given ideas from them to help concept and kind of bring to life, they would be this uh, thought of and concepted through the lens of a captive audience. Uh, and what we knew, the only thing that we knew, because we only ever worked on the internet, was that we didn't have a captive audience. The internet is not a captive audience. The internet are a bunch of people whose attention you have to get, and what you offer them better be useful and it better be honest. At least that's, that's our opinion. Uh, truth matters now more than ever. This is uh, something that is, we've started to chip away at and uh, is percolating in our office. And I've been in conversations with folks at other agencies, um, we even came across a video uh, a couple days ago where there was another agency saying the exact same thing, and my vice president said, I don't know if this is going to piss you off or you're going to love it. And I, I loved it. Like, I, there's something percolating in our industry where the digital natives are realizing that a captive audience doesn't exist, and if we're going to engage with them, we better offer something useful, uh, and it better be true. Because, uh, as we know about millennials, this emerging generation, uh, they can, you know, it's been said, they can feel truth. I mean, we all can feel truth. Truth resonates. And so when, when someone comes at us with some message that, that's bullshit, we know it, we feel it, and we reject it, especially millennials. So we're realizing now that, uh, that A, first and foremost, uh, the user and their desires and their interests and their time has to be respected and considered uh, you have to put them first in the equation, which is ironic because later in my presentation you'll see that they're not first, they're brands first, but never mind that. Um, you have to put them first, you have to understand them, they're not captive, you've got to know what's up. Uh, and then secondarily, when you do talk to them, tell the truth. You have to tell the truth. Be honest. Gimmicks, there's a place for gimmicks, there's a place for humor. We all know it, we pass around you know, things about cats and whatever. There's a place and a time for all that, uh, but gimmicks manipulation, so on and so forth, uh, there's not really a place for it any longer. And I think more and more, uh, we're going to recognize that. We're going to recognize that brands can't, we can't, just make up a story and decide to tell it. We have to tell the truth. Uh, so some context. Not too long ago, uh, just a handful, you know, and I realize I'm preaching to the choir with, with all of this, so y'all know that the internet came and changed some things, but... I just need to do the context for myself, if nothing else. Not too long ago, uh, there was a captive audience. We learned about uh, the music that we should buy from wacky morning DJs who are incentivized by uh, money and lots of other stuff uh, by the slimy record labels. We've got Artie Fufkin here, who, poor guy, just did promotion for Spinal Tap. He was kind and nice. And, uh, but the, these guys were the ones influencing the Wacky Morning DJs. Uh, we learned about restaurants from Yellow Pages. We were sold from pitchmen about what we should buy and why we should buy it. And that was okay. It was, the only other, it was the only option. Information, access, truth. It wasn't available to us. We were only given, uh, we, were, you know, we were only fed what we were given and we, we would only eat what we were, what we were fed. I mean, it was, the, the whole thing was just a, just a one-sided conversation. We know this. Then, of course, we know what happened. The internet, access to anything, everything, always, truth. Yes, this is the light show, I planned this. <laughs> Everybody stay cool, Every, no one freak out. Um, this has changed everything, obviously. The great equalizer, we have truth in our hands. It used to be on our desktops, but just a couple years ago that changed. Now we have it in our hands. All the time, 100% of the time, right? Almost. I mean, we go to sleep, and then the first thing we do is we pick it up, we check out Facebook, we check it. You know, we're wired in all the time. This has had a obviously had a large impact on society, from the glib things of marketing to governments. Uh, it's it's equalizing manipulation. It's equalizing truth. It's equalizing um, oppression. So now we review products. We, you know, I we shouldn't have to read this. We know what the internet does. We, we go on, uh, you know, we, we, we review products on, on this side, on that side. On the, you know, we, uh, 
uh, learn about restaurants from Yelp. We learn about what, web, uh, what travel to go to from TripAdvisor. Like nothing and very often do we interact with the brands themselves, which frankly bodes a question for folks like at least me who work with brands to help market them online. Where do we sit? But one day at a time on that. Uh, the impact has been the great equalizer. So now truth, access, information proceeds and permeates every person. I mean, any one of you could catch me in the hallway, bullshit me about uh, who you are and what you've done. I could go on your LinkedIn and I could find the truth, unless you're bullshitting there too. I could join your Facebook and I could see what your friends think about you. Like, truth permeates from the individual to the brand, the organization, the government. Obviously, we know back in 2010, Egypt, a, a people, a country, long manipulated, long uh, oppressed, were freed, started from obviously outrage, courage, but the, 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 the device we know, some people say there was a tweet that did it, some people say there was a Facebook page that w grouped the people together, but the bottom line is that there was no more room for the manipulation and the lies uh, uh, because the, the internet was available to everybody and it, and it, and it, 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 um, it equalized. No longer was the guy who was oppressing them, uh, was he the voice that was, now they were the voice, but we know this. Information, knowledge, truth, now proceeds and permeates, and yes, it does set free. You know, um, the funny thing about this is that, I don't know if it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, I, I, I think it's, at least I think it's a true thing, that the more knowledge and the more access that we give, the more we expect. Um, I don't know where we all end up with all that, but um, I'll save the psychology for another time. But it, it, in any case, the bottom line is, is that the more we are given, the more we expect. I, uh, this weekend was found myself on uh, John Mayer's Instagram. Uh, no big deal. Daughters was a good song. You don't need to. Uh, <laughs> it's not totally uncool for an adult man like John Mayer. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I, I wound up on it, and I was looking at the photos, and I could, you could just tell that they were highly curated. He probably has some kid who works for him who's there to update his Instagram. I've seen it a thousand times. We work with a handful of artists. In fact, we do that. The other company, Ground Control, does that for a bunch of artists. Uh, and I, I, I happened to look at how many friends he had. He had 100, 163,000 uh, friends or followers or whatever. And uh, I thought that, that was incredible. And that would be a lot for you or I. But my barber has 80,000 followers on Instagram. I swear to God, 80,000 followers on Instagram. So I thought, like, what is the problem here? And then I wound up on Macklemore's, who I do follow, uh, from y'all's town, uh, and he has 2.1 million followers. And the difference was, like, I was looking at a photo of Macklemore, and he's taking a photo at a truck stop with him and some dude who works at a truck stop with a bunch of Chex Mix and Pringles and, 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 and gummy bears and whatever he was buying. Now, all that seems somewhat insignificant, but I think that the thing that's interesting, and I don't think that it is, okay, well, Macklemore's target is younger and whatever, and John Mayer's isn't. Frankly, I think we all know that that's the... Uh, that's the Instagram ecosystem uh, within both of those people. The thing that was very, very different is what Macklemore was giving was everything of him. He was putting it all out there. Well, okay, you know, buying checks, on that's everything of him. But, you know, that's, he's putting himself out there. Better or worse, this is me at a truck stop. John Mayer was saying, hold on, I have a brand. I need to manage my brand. I'm going to hire this kid. He's going to take a cool photo. No, I don't like that photo. My hair doesn't look good there. I'd probably do something like that. Uh, no, put this photo up. This is where I look good. And, and as a result, people don't really find it all that interesting. Um, at least that's what the numbers show. And uh, this access to truth, information, um, anything, always, ever, it's growing. We all know the internet's going away. So I thought this was interesting. This presentation right here forced me to look up this stuff, because whoever looks up, I mean, maybe you all do, I don't look up. What's the growth rate of the internet? You know, uh, global internet users. When I uh, started the company, 6% of the world was on the internet. Uh, three years later, it nearly doubled. Uh, in March, 10 years after that, of 2013, the last time, 
this report was done, almost the majority of people uh, on the planet have access to the internet. And by 2020, 4 billion are expected. That would be the majority of human beings on this planet will have access to truth, everything, always, ever. Now, in our own backyard, uh, you know, as the, the privileged nation that we are, of course, we know that uh, the majority of people are on the internet, 79%. Uh, I think that that's interesting. I think that it begs the question, and something I, I wrote that was on, uh, I hadn't read it in a while, but it was the, the, the preview of today's thing, and I ended it with the question of how do we market in a world where everyone already knows everything anyway? People have truth, people have access. How do you tell them a story? You, you definitely can't tell them a story that's not true. Uh, but but how, can you, how can you market? I think it becomes uh, very, very different. So now what? What do we do? How do we do it? Where does it start? I'll go over, so th these things I'm about to go over are uh, what we at Buckwild are, is like, it's rather obnoxious, to be honest with you. Like, if, if you get stuck in a, in a car with me on the way to San Francisco, which happens a, a couple times a week, anyone on my staff are stuck in the car, they have to hear me rattle off, but what about this? And I got to, I mean, they like, they placate me and they're like, yeah, totally. Like, but I'm sure they're overhearing about this. And what, I'm, what, what we've done is just brought it down to some very fundamental questions that we ask the clients that we're working with. We recently... Uh, uh, one, Cliff Barr, as a client, we are their digital agency for a group of 19 folks. It was, a, it was a big feat. It was one that we were proud of. And we've found ourselves in the company of an organization that was dedicated to honesty and truth, living outside of themselves and their own desires, uh, their own needs, and doing it through authenticity um, uh, from the get-go. That sounds like I'm selling their product. I'm not. Uh, but it's begged all kinds of questions from us. So now what? How do we do it? So of course, at the Seattle Interactive Conference, as a guy standing on a stage that does digital, I'm going to say user experience, right? Like Apple, excuse me, obviously changed the world with um, great digital experience or user experience. Um, but what's occurred to us uh, lately is that user experience um, starts long before there is something to interact with. And um, about two years ago, through some uh, soul searching of our, of our own at our agency, we, we started to say, hey, we have, like this whole question of where we start of, um, uh, you know, would you use this? Would you use that? Like th this whole cynical thing that we start most of our concepting with, or where at some point we're in it, there's something here that we can bottle. There's something that we're recognizing that's different than our friends at the traditional agencies who have been working with a captive audience. This thing, this, would you use this? Like, who gives a shit? Like, like why should I care? That thing, that cynicism, to me, is the fundamental difference between uh, digital natives and the other folks. That, where you start with, like, why should I care? Just tell me, is is the fundamental difference. At least, again, this is just my opinion, and it's a, uh, um, a recent observation, a recent uh, thing that we've, we've come into. So where does it start? Uh, I, you know, if, if I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, branding experts in here, and any one of them is, are going to say, like, this is, what you're talking about is branding. What you're talking about has been around for a long time. And... Maybe that's true. Maybe I've just finally got it. Maybe I mean, I'm not being self-deprecating. I'm being serious when I say that. The user experience starts long before. It starts when a brand decides, a company decides, a group of people decide what they stand for. In fact, there's a slide about that. So I'll talk about it. Uh, for a good user experience, you do you. Okay? There's every brand. Um, in fact, I have a note here about what slide is it? This is 13. I don't have a note about that. Full transparency. This is, that's what this conference is about. I don't. Uh, uh, you do you. So this is um, ultimately when, when we're uh, with our clients uh, and they have a desire, they have an objective that goes outside of who they naturally are, we're trying to suggest to them, no, 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 no. Calm down. 
You do you. We uh, had the pleasure of working with, um, and I may as well just say the name, I, I, I doubt it would matter. Uh, we had the pleasure of working with a wine company uh, earlier in the year called Cupcake Wine. Uh, do you guys know who Cupcake is? I, I can't possibly have taken a poll just now, but I'm guessing that the majority of the hands were females. That's, that's an, an important part of the story. So, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't trying to be emasculating to the, to the men who were like, yeah, hella. I hella drink that. I had it last night. I'm hungover on it. Uh, uh, when they came to us, they, were, they had already wound up uh, number two in their category. Now, they're a price point wine. Uh, in other words, if you're a wine guy or gal, uh, you probably don't drink it or don't drink it often. It's a price point wine, but it's a good price point. It's crafted. It's, in fact, that's the only key differentiator between them and who is in number one place, Kendall Jackson. Uh, Kendall Jackson is a, is a mass-made wine, uh, and there is no winemaker involved. There's probably just, you know, some spreadsheets in a lab that work on a computer that, like, put all the things into a, you know, and then it puts it into a box and it sends it to the thing. Like, it's a very, very scientific thing. So when they came to us, they said, okay, we're number two. Great. But like most companies, they wanted to grow. Every company wants to grow. That's, we want more, 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 more. Okay. So they wanted to become number one. So they said, how are we going to become number one? We've already captured all the gals. Gals love our wine. That's how we became number, two. Uh, yeah, number two. In fact, if you look, if you uh, were to you know, search them on Instagram or any of the other channels, you'd find that there's a whole bunch of people who post their stuff. And they post it uh, naturally. They just like, no agency was behind it. The gals, primarily, uh, took a photo with them, the cupcake bottle or whatever, and they post it. And so they said, okay, so we've captured them. Obviously, to get to number one, we need to capture the dudes. So once we capture the dudes, we're going to be number one. So they came to us, and for their website, they said, we want a section in our website called the locker room, where there's going to be stuff about sports. There's going to be, you know, photos of chicks. Uh, and, I'm not, you know, I'm not meaning to be a dick. I'm not meaning to be like, well, you know better than you guys are idiots. I can't believe you had that terrible idea. Um, but what was clear to us was that that's just not naturally who they are. Now, this is a simple and almost silly anecdote, right? Because I think most people would know, like, whoa, 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 stop. Like, don't do that. Uh, but we said instead, we said, okay, let's, let's slow down. Let's get to know your user a little bit more, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, let's find out where they interact, why they interact with, with you, uh, uh, why they buy it, and what is different about you. What's true about you? So we went through this brand discovery and we found, we learned that they're crafted. There's this handsome Australian dude who's their winemaker. And uh, that was a, a key differentiator. That was the differentiator between them and number one. So we said, okay, great. Handsome Australian dude with an accent is your key differentiator. Let's, put, let's make some content about that guy because uh, your core audience are, may you know, have an affinity towards him also. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I can't decide to sit down, I stand up, I sit down, I don't know what's going on. Um, anyway, so uh, they, uh, fortunately for us, they, they uh, and maybe for them too, they, they uh, conceded to our recommendations. We did that. We launched a, a website that, um, you know, benchmarks, benchmarks, you know, all kinds of good stuff. It was, uh, it was good for them. But, but you do you. You know, I think that if any of us are in charge of a brand or a part of a brand or part of a project, I think the more we can push our clients towards whatever it is that's honest about them, it's going to be more successful for them. But what is honest about them? Where do you start? Okay, what do you stand for? So this is something, uh, what do you stand for, what do you do, and why does it matter? That's essentially what we're going to go over here in a second and something about users. Uh, these, this three-part story arc, what do you stand for, what do you do? Why does it matter? In fact, I heard from somebody uh, in your neck of the woods, uh, the CEO of Tableau, uh, we started work, uh, they make a software, data visualization software. We started working with them a long time ago. The CEO is the most, uh, uh, maybe this will get back to him at some point and it'll sound like I'm a real kiss ass, but uh, he's this the most charismatic, like he looks at, he's looking into your soul. It's like a, it's a weird thing. He said, it in, he said it in one of our meetings, you know, there's what you stand for, there's what you do, and there's why it matters. And I was like, holy shit, you just made my 
my whole universe get into like order here? What do you stand for? You know, this obviously sounds like the mission statement, mission and values, and we've heard this corporate speak forever. And it is, it is the mission and values. But how often have we read or we heard of, we've been um, uh, a part of some mission statement that's bullshit, right? Like more than, more often than not. It's bullshit, it doesn't actually apply to their products, their services, their behaviors, the people that they hire, the way that they act uh, when they're working with their consumers or whatever. It's just, you know, it was done for the, uh, for the shareholders, it was done for the business plan, it was done to get the financing, it was done to da 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 da, -da. It, was, it was checking boxes. What we're getting to now, this, the, the, you know, the internet equalizing, demanding uh, truth and knowledge, it's gonna permeate you anyway. It's forcing us, I believe, to get back to that and say, so, hold on a second, what do we really, really stand for? And I'm not necessarily talking about something super philosophical and whatever. Like, I don't know what Apple's mission statement is. I have no idea. I've never looked at it. Uh, I'm not just making this up. I didn't think. I'm guessing uh, it has something to do with, uh, you know, we stand for an elevated user experience or something along those lines. And then what they do is the product that they offer, that they sell, and that we're using, I'm using, and so on and so forth, and that reinforces that platform. That reinforces, it really does. And why does it matter? It matters in all kinds of ways for them. What do you stand for? It's an important thing. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. What do you do? Again, uh, this is the part, this is the product, this is the service, this is how it's applicable. Uh, so what you stand for, and there's what you do. And uh, the, you know, the, the most important part here is the alignment with what you stand for. I'm gonna look, at, see if I, I, I had these notes, I was diligent about them and I haven't even looked at them. Why should I care? This is the impact, this is the why it matters to me. Yes. Uh, the alignment of, uh, of the product that's offered reinforced by what you stand for. Um, you know, this is, a good example of uh, if Cupcake hadn't have, you know, uh, if, if they would have combated us and argued and said, no, we're gonna stick to this man thing, we would, this uh, what do you do doesn't line up with who they say that they are. Uh, and that would, have been, um, that would have been bullshit. And there's no more room for bullshit anymore. Why should I care? So, this is the question that more often than not, we find ourselves as, as a digital shop. So we're still, so we're a digital agency for some clients, Cliff Bar, like I had mentioned, a handful of others, and then we're also still a digital partner for traditional advertising agencies. That still happens until today, and then no one will ever hire us again because I was uh, saying how we knew it all better, which I'm not. Um, why should I care? This is the question that usually we're involved with. So this is communicating to, uh, you know, like brands often say, because our product's better. Well, no, 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 <laughs> that's not good enough. Like there's a reason why as a consumer, why as a user, I should give a shit about your product. And it's not for everybody, it's for a specific group of people. It serves a need, it's useful, I'm sure of it. Every product is, and the ones that aren't, they typically usually fall away. Why should I care? This is, uh, you know, so more often than not, I can't tell you how many digital campaigns we've been a part of, where it was, you know, upload your face to whatever, uh, it was some Facebook, some, some gratuitous use of, um, of uh, holding hostage social users on Facebook through some brand message that, why are they going to care? Why, why are, you know, I, we said to a client, uh, kindly, who we work with, that we have a relationship with, so it was, we were at liberty to suggest this, that their idea, they wanted to put some message on, on Facebook that was like, who cares? Like, no one's gonna interact with this. And I told them, I was like, dude, this is exactly why people are getting off of Facebook. Like, because your shit is in my feed and I don't care. I'm sorry for the language, I'm getting all riled up. Uh, your stuff's in my feed and I don't care. I don't care about it. This isn't the place for it. This isn't the channel for it. There's a, there's a channel for most messages. Uh, we'll get to channel selection in a second, but why should I care? This is the next part. For a good user experience, know who you're talking to. So, 
uh, you know, most branding experts, advertising folks would say, we do this. We do qualitative. We do quantitative. We do uh, research, that is. Um, we do focus groups. We, show, we put our creative and we test it. We put it in front of folks and we get their feedback on it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about l really actually getting to know the people who buy your product or your, your client's product. Um, when we started our relationship with Cliff Bar, we made this recommendation. And, and usually this recommendation is met with, which always blows my mind, is met with, we have no, no budget for that. Now, we've been a part of a, a, a load of interactive campaigns that, that at times, if anyone is involved in these sorts of projects, you'd know, they overpay their vendor. They, we've been overpaid before. We've been underpaid more often than not, unfortunately. But I wish the other one had happened more. Uh, and, but yet there's no money for research. There's no time. Well, we don't have time for that. We don't have time to understand, to get to know, to sit down with, et cetera, and so on. Uh, it's my opinion that, 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 that you should, you know, not in all cases, of course I'm generally speaking here, but it, in a lot of cases, you should just stop. Just don't do it. Put it on hold. If, if, if it's, you, you got to get that thing out there because there's a media campaign, push back the media campaign. You got to get to know the user. Even if, uh, you know, you know, that whole complaint about we don't have budget for this, because usually research um, is expensive. It's, it's super expensive. Qualitative, quantitative, if you have to hire a third party, you have to go to that weird, creepy place where there's like a window and you sit behind it, and then there's, a lot of li there's always licorice for some reason. I don't know why. Um, uh, I, you know, we started doing these super casual, inviting um, customers, our clients' customers, to our office years ago. In fact, we did one. Here, our first one was here maybe four or five years ago for Smart Wool. They make socks. I'm wearing them right now. Um, and we bought them pizza, and we bought them beer, and we sat and asked them questions. Uh, why do you buy the product? Um, what makes you loyal to this brand? Are, do, you, do you care about this brand? Here are the values that this brand says they have. Do you think that that's true? Here are the values that the brand says they have. Do you care at all about these values? Or is just the product better? Is it just more comfortable? Do you care about whatever, whatever, whatever? It's an important thing. You know, take a few people to coffee. Uh, buy them a drink. Buy them a pizza. Uh, if you have the money and the time for it, do quantitative, do qualitative, do surveys, do... Don't do the creepy glass window room. You don't have to do that. Like, but do, we just did a whole bunch for uh, Cliff Bar in San Francisco. We did some in Sacramento. And we got together with folks and we asked them uh, a whole uh, load of questions. And we found... We found something super interesting. Uh, you know, the, the folks at Cliff Bar are uh, athletes. They're, they're adventurous folks. They're the people that you kind of imagine they are if you close your eyes and you think about what are the people who work at Cliff Bar like? They're like, they're, you know, they're triathletes. They're all that stuff. And, you know, as most brands do, you get kind of myopic into like, this is, this is who we are. This is who we serve. We serve the core, the triathletes, and da 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 And... If we go outside of that, we're going to alienate those folks. So let's just talk to the athletes. So we, um, we went fishing for the target audience. We uh, scoured forums, the triathlete forums. I don't know why I have to do this. Uh, it really was a triathlete forum. Um, we uh, looked at their, you know, what they said about themselves on their social profiles, and we captured those people that say that they're the core athlete folks. Then we... Had, we got together with the groups, uh, we, we, and they showed up, and, and they didn't look at all like extreme athletes, like their social profiles said that they were. They looked like normal folks, and they were, and that was the truth. And what, so you know, just and there, there's a whole bunch of other things that we learned, but just in just in that, like, just the people showed up, and our client was there, and we're like, see, these are the people who think that they're athletes and adventurers, who you just think are normal people. You're leaving, you're, you're not even talking to them, and you're only talking to the super, super core, the people that run Ironmans, and that's only a small group of folks, right? Like, uh, so already that started to like broaden, and we started to get, get to know them. We asked them a whole bunch of other questions. Who are they? Um, you know, this is common stuff. Uh, uh, like I was saying just a second ago, but, you know, uh, who are they really? So we got to know these folks. What we found is that normal folks are... Uh, are, you know, these, these folks are just normal folks. Uh, we create, oftentimes we create personifications of the target audience. This isn't new. 
We all do this. We put them into groups. We get to know them. We get to know what drives them and so on. Where are they? What is their media consumption? Also not rocket science. What is their digital consumption? What are they interacting with? When are they interacting with it? Why are they interacting with it? What time of the day? What type of content? All this stuff super matters. To get to know your emotional drivers, why people interact with content, why they share it, what, is, it, is, it is it funny? Is it aspirational? Is it informational? Is it listatorial? 25 ways, to, three ways to develop a good user experience? You know, is it, what are the things that they engage with? What are the things that they share? There are drivers, there's psychological drivers to why people are putting the stuff out on their walls and their feeds that they're, we, we should get to know what those are so that we can meet them where they are with what they want. That's a thing we say in our office all the time. Um, and what moves them? You know, again, the emotional drivers. Um, we, uh, when we got to know I'll use Cliff Bar again. When we got to know Cliff Bar really well, what we found is that uh, they were different than our agency's perceptions. We didn't know about Cliff Bar very well when we first got invited to pitch them. Uh, we, I assumed that they were a public company. I assumed that they were owned by you know, whoever, Nabisco or whatever the hell. Uh, I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought. Okay. So then uh, the truth was is that it's owned and run by the husband and wife who started it. Uh, uh, the other portion of the company is owned by the employees who work there. They have a strong, incredibly strong dedication to sustainability, unlike any client I've ever experienced. They don't talk about it because they're afraid it would look bad, I suppose. They're afraid to exploit it, which I can appreciate. Uh, so we were pretty moved by this. Uh, our team, we were like, holy smoke, the guy who started the company is right here. Like He's still working here. This is insane. And we wanted to tell the story. So we, we tested that idea, like I was saying earlier about testing creative ideas. We asked them, okay, here are all the values and things that are true about Cliff Bar. Folk who buy the product, do you, are you intrigued by any of this? All the stuff that we were intrigued by, no one gave a shit about. <laughs> no one cared that they were independently owned. No one cared. What they cared about was where do their ingredients come from? It's like the we're all interested in it, but I mean, I can't help but think of like, is it local? Is it local? Is the chicken local? Like, Portlandia? No? Um, where does it, we need to know like everything. This is, that's my, I mean, that's kind of a, that's my point, is the, the more information we have, the more addicted to the information we have, we need to know every piece of information about every damn thing we buy. Um, that was important to them. Now, a lot of other things. Rule three for good user experience, share your values, let the chips fall where they may. So for us, in our little group, this is where the stuff kind of comes together. Um, what we say is there's what the brand wants to say, there's what users want to know, and we see ourselves as the steward of the in-between. The in-between is the user experience strategy somewhere in there. Now you can't be everything to everybody, but there's a group of people out there that once you say, this is what I stand for, once you've made sure that my product, my service, my team members, my, you know, the whole darn thing lines up with that, then you get to know the user. What is it that's driving them? What is it that's causing them to engage, et cetera, and so on and so forth? You now understand the values of one group and understand the values of another group. If you can speak to shared values, this is the bottom line. I mean, in, in our world, of course, there's all kinds of different kinds of marketing. But what I'm interested in, what I think is the, the thing that moves people, the thing that really causes dedication to a product, to a service, to an organization, to a person, et cetera, and so forth, is shared values. I don't think that that's rocket science. I think that um, most of us know that we, we become a part of some group because we share values with the culture, et cetera, and so on. But I'm talking about if we can personify this um, and really find out those intricacies, those truths, and we can share those values, it creates something um, that's long, that's lasting, that's true. You can't be everything to everybody, so don't bother. This goes back to my previous point. You know, uh, clients' um, KPIs for success, to me, often are, are funny. Like, there's, 
your standard KPIs for success, like, you know, we want to grow, and then the KPI would be, you know, more money, uh, or users, or consumers, or whatever, really just means, what they really mean is they just want more money. That's fine, I get it. There's shareholders, usually, and so on. Uh, you know, in our world, in the digital world, we want people on the website for a longer period of time, we want them to come back all the time, we want, we want to be the, you know, their, their home screen when they start their browser, you know, it's like, the, like the, the, uh, we um, did a website redesign and, and UX uh, strategy for VSP, um, visual, uh, which uh, you guys probably may or may not be familiar with, most people aren't because it's an insurance company or they're not particularly, you know, passionate about it. Uh, vision Service Plan, it's the largest vision uh, service provider in the country. They're founded out of uh, Sacramento. And when we sat down with them, of course, we start with, what are your objectives? And the dude, the, you know, the head marketing guy, we said, we want people on the site for longer, and we want them to come back often. I said, okay, I get it. I get that, you know, <laughs> I'm going to sound like a jerk again. I get that you read that somewhere in a Wired article or whatever, like CMO Weekly, but like, <laughs> let's just stop and think for a moment. You're an insurance company. You provide vision service. Now, now granted, that's a metric that, that shows a success for a lot of different kinds of organizations. If your folk are on your website for three seconds and find what they want and never have to come back again, hallelujah. That is a success. That's your KPI. You want those numbers to come down. Uh, you can't be everything, uh, you know, I don't even know where, how I, why that even came to mind. But it's just the, the, the idea that this brand wants to be everything to everyone, always, forever, it has to be questioned. Like, no, you don't, and no, you can't, and stop it with that nonsense. Uh, and yes, oh yes, tell the truth. Um, it's almost becoming, I don't know how telling the truth can be a cliche or trendy, but it's definitely, you know, you see these, and we're responsible for some sometimes. Um, there's a lot of videos uh, that get made these days about the product and its origin and its founder, and then there's a sunburst in the background, and like it shows him waking up at his house, and he gets into his car, and he drives to the office, and like we're moved by it because we want to know the origin. We want to know the truth. We want to know, give me a reason to buy your shit. Give me a reason. Just That's all I want to know. I want to know where it came from, why you made it, and why that matters to me. Uh, you know, the chicken from Portlandia. We just, we want to know, we want to know it all. Uh, the truth, you know, where we, the truth is, can be found in a number of areas. The trend, though, is, is, is uh, highlighting the origin of products, highlighting the origin of the organization. How did it start? Why did it start? Highlighting the origin of the founders. People love founders. People hate CEOs, but they love founders. People like the idea of, other people starting something, put their fingerprint on something. They don't like CEOs who run shit and make a lot of money for nothing, but they love founders. So what's the, what's the story? What's the history? What's the reason? We want to know the truth. We want to know where it came from. If you find the truth, tell the truth. And it kind of goes back to that, you know, that, that little thing that we did for that wine company. Uh, okay, hold on. You know, no. What is true about you, though? Well, we've got this guy, and we do this thing, and that's different than these other people. Sweet. Let's do that. Let's talk about that. What's true? The fruit of all of this um, are users who know what they want and know why they want it. This is a very, you know, this is, for us, this is the success. This is uh, the bottom line for us. We say often in our office uh, and in and, and client offices, and everyone has to hear us rattle on about this, but the fruit of a good user experience is an equitable exchange, that we don't have a captive audience, so what we're offering better be of value. Users who know what they want and know why they want it, equate to something. It equates to cheerleaders. People who know why they buy something. People are told to buy this thing, and they're programmed, they're robots, and they buy it, and they, go to the, and they put it in the shelf, and they put it in their cart, and they, they go home, and they put it in their... That's, that doesn't create a cheerleader. People who know what they want, and know why they're buying it, that creates a cheerleader. Because we all love to brag, oh, you know, I bought this thing, and here's a story about that thing. It's organic, and the seeds come from 
God knows where. You know, we love to tell that story to our friends. We love to brag about it. We love to know that there was a reason we bought it and so on and so forth. That creates cheerleaders. That creates client retention or customer retention. You know, that once you know where it came from and once you have the story of it and so on and so forth, you see that thing on the shelf next to three other things that look just like it. That gives you that one reason. Just give me a reason to buy it. That gives you that one reason to put it in your cart. It gives you that one reason to become a follower, to, to listen to it. To, I just want to know the truth behind it. It's, it creates leaders, uh, cheerleaders. It creates customer retention, client retention. Uh, and it creates growth because cheerleaders beget other folks. You know, I tell my friend about it, so on and so forth. You guys know the drill. Uh, and that is, um, at the end of the day, most of our, our uh, us, it's usually our objective, is to create these users. And again, I told you, you're not going to hear anything here you're going to see on the cover of Wired or whatever. Um, because I don't think that there's anything new. I think that we're human beings. Truth resonates. I think we're moved by specific things. I think the things that were true 3,000 years ago are true today. Tell the truth. People will like you better. <laughs> People will know why they like you. And the people that don't like you got a good reason, and you don't want them to like you anyway. Oftentimes when we go, to, go into a pitch, and a lot of folks say this sort of stuff, we tell them, you're going to know by the end of this thing whether you love us or hate us. Like, we're just going to tell you the truth, and transparency is kind of our thing, and if, uh, this isn't going to be a thing, this isn't going to be a hard decision for you. You're going to hate us, you're going to love us, we're going to tell you the truth, and we're going to let the chips fall where they may. Um, these are just fundamental truths that I think that are at least true to us, um, and they're, uh, they're driving our shop and the stuff that we're doing for our clients. If you can't tell, I'm winding it down. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, so 41 minutes. I was so terrified that I had, so I sent this thing to my vice president, and he's like, dude, how long are you speaking? I was like, 45 minutes, and he said, you have like 12 minutes of material here. I was like, no, I can pontificate for a long time. You should know that. Uh, anyway, so uh, are there any questions, thoughts, arguments? Yes. Uh, so qualitative, when we're, when we're doing qualitative, um, small groups, groups of 10, and we do multiple groups of 10. And you know, like, we over-invite because no one does what they say they're going to do, and, and then sometimes 12 show, show up and sometimes 5 show up. But we do small groups. And then, you know, when we do uh, quantitative, of course, we would send surveys out to, is, you know, kind of as many people as we can sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a group of 10 is great. And, you know, like most groups, they feed off of each other and, you know. And then there is, on occasion, we'll do one-on-ones if we feel the content, if one person's opinion is going to affect another person's opinion. It depends on the client. It depends on the subject matter. It depends on... Uh, we did a lot of one-on-ones for VSP um, years ago, yeah. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, the, the, most clients want that for some reason, like, because they want more clients, and they don't want to piss off the clients that they can count on. Um, you know, can they honestly stand there would be uh, the question. You know, like, we just say, like, build an authentic platform, have a product that allows you to properly stand there. You, you just heard all this. But, like, um, is there another segment that can authentically benefit from their, pro their product? And this whole thing that, like, uh, companies do of like, then the core won't buy our thing anymore or whatever. Is I I think I haven't I haven't done any qualitative or quantitative study on this, but I think that that's bullshit. Like, if if Cliff Bar for example starts marketing to surfers, I don't think the triathlete's going to be like, what? Like, I'm not buying your stuff no more. Like, it's just going to be like, oh okay cool yeah those people are active too or whatever. Now if they start marketing to 
I don't know, sloths, or I don't, you know, I don't know, like the couch potato, then I get it. But, you know, where can they naturally gravitate to? That's, that would be, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. When we were just a production company to advertising agencies, I was over it. I hit, I hit a point in about '09 where I almost left that company, uh, Buckwild, and went with my music, the Ground Control, the earlier client, uh, company I was talking about, because it was just like this isn't interesting. Producing other people's ideas is not interesting. So what is keeping, what's kept me going these last couple of years of really fine, like finally, like excuse the phrase, growing a pair and saying what we believed in, and finding my next step right now, my focus, is to find our perfect fit client. Because this stuff that I'm talking about doesn't, can't appeal to everybody, obviously. And we're a small shop. I have no desire to be, you know, whatever. Uh, and I have no desire to sell, either. I, the independent thing, you know, being a founder or whatever, like, that's super important to me. Um, and so I'm trying to find those clients who, like I was saying earlier, who, who share our values, who share those same values, either, so from one hand, telling the truth and being an honest brand, but then two, being human people. I wrote this little thing on a plane. I was all frustrated coming back from having met with a bunch of clients. And I wrote this thing of like, why do I do this? Why do I run this agency? And I'm not going to go into it, but there was like four or five things. I ended up like writing a I was super into it and posted it somewhere. And my PR agency that, that represents us, they're like, don't do this, like, you sound like an asshole. But it was just like, we want to find clients who, who respect us as individuals, who respect us as, we're, we're family people, I have four boys, I've been married for a thousand years. Uh, we're not the sort of, like, work till, uh, work every weekend, work till midnight. We, we don't think that we're saving children until we work with a client who does, maybe. But, like, we, we're just selling more shit that people don't need, let's be honest for a second. So, why do we do it? Why do I do it? I do it for, because I, as a creative person, enjoy leaving my fingerprint on something. It's super exciting. It's really, really fun. Uh, I, uh, I like having a good time. I love my staff. My team, my team is super fun. I like providing an atmosphere for other family folks who want to do good work, but also realize, uh, you know, you can be down to earth and humble about the whole thing. Uh, that's, that super drives me. So, that was a long answer for your question. But it's just, you know, we're slowly chipping away at, like, this is getting more and more interesting the more idealistic we, be we become. We may be left with no clients, but we're getting more idealistic. <laughs> yes? Hi. Um, there, are, there are some companies that um, don't have interesting products that, don't, that aren't great companies. This, there are some evil corporations. There are companies that don't yet have a story to tell that, that will be compelling for anybody or, or just might be boring, you know, there's that, that, that other side of, of things. And aside from, uh, clearly they need to like do some more exploration and you know, maybe change some values, but in the short term, um, what should they do? Have you ever worked with companies where you're like, I don't know what to tell you, you guys suck. Um, you know, <laughs> just hang it up or. You know what, yeah, we're working with one right now. Yeah. It's, it's challenging. Uh, it's challenging because they want to be cool and they're not cool and they'll never be cool. They sell a product that's not cool. Go ahead, please. No, no. Okay. Uh, I wanted to hear it. Um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I mean, the, the reality is, is that there's, there's usually a true value to most products, especially if the products are being purchased. If it's a startup, I can't tell you the amount of times that we get confronted by startups who, like, want us to partner with them and, like, do their stuff for free and we get equity. Like, I would be the owner of, like, a thousand startups that aren't you know, probably worth anything. The startups I've started aren't worth anything either, so it's, a, it's perfectly fine. Um, uh, but if it's an existing product, if it's an existing service, and people are buying it, it serves a purpose. It has a value. There's reasons why people are buying it. So why? You know, uh, but, you know, that client that I was mentioning a second ago, I don't want to say, they're, they're super nice people, and, but they want us to design stuff. They want us to do super cool design and sell a product that just is not, like, no one cool is ever going to use the product. So, uh, anyway, and it's, you know, I can't tell you that we're always 100% fundamental with this stance. 
You know, as we're a bootstrapped company. Uh, you know, we have folks to pay. Like sometimes the needs of our company outweigh the ideals that we have, and that's just the truth. Unfortunately, that's capitalism. We just did a big project for McDonald's in the beginning of the year. Like every time I present it to a client, I just say like, this isn't God's work, but you know, like just, you know, it's McDonald's and you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, yeah, thanks. Survival is a value. Survival sometimes is difficult, and, but it, thank you, yeah. Uh, any other questions, thoughts, concerns, arguments? Sweet. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.